We're continuing our discussion looking at what makes a good manager by looking at Mintzberg's qualities of a successful manager. So there's quite a list here. And we talked before Henry Mintzberg, right? He wrote this book, Simply Managing, uh, and is a Canadian uh, professor and content expert in terms of uh, helping managers. And so in his conversations with many, many managers, what he's found is these are the qualities of successful managers. I'm not going to read them all to you. You can pause this uh, slide and, uh, and capture this information down. Uh, but as you look at this list, think about yourself. Which of these qualities do you have? Are you courageous, curious, confident, reflective? Are you candid? Are you insightful? Are you tolerant of people's ideas and of individuals? Are you communicative, innovative? Are you consistent, but also flexible? Are you perceptive, wise? Are you proactive and decisive? Are you pragmatic? Are you passionate, visionary? Are you energetic? Are you able to integrate ideas? Are you ambitious, persistent, collaborative? engaging, empathetic? Are you dependable and stable? Are you accountable, fair, and honest? So what we're going to be looking at in this video is we're going to be looking at some of these qualities of a successful manager and start to assess, do we have those qualities? Interestingly, we read about in Henry Mintzberg's Simply Managing book, one of the characteristics or qualities he finds of many managers is that last one that you see on the screen. That is, they're tall. <laughs> so I'm not particularly tall, uh, pretty short actually. Uh, so uh, I don't know, does that mean that I can't be a successful manager because I don't have everything on the list? Well, I'm not tall, are you? Uh, do you have these items here? Well, I wanna point to one in particular, not on this slide, but on the next one. And that is managers are flawed. They're not perfect. They don't have every item on that list. Uh, they are flawed human beings. According to Peter Drucker, another uh, management expert, the task of leadership is to create an alignment of strengths so as to make people's weaknesses irrelevant. When you are building an organization, you're going to build that organizations with flawed managers. And the idea here is to recognize their strengths and build that team so that their weaknesses are irrelevant. So they complement each other in terms of making sure that all of these strengths and qualities of successful manager are reflected in the team, even if they're not in an individual. As we look at management, we had talked many times about the word manager and the word leader, and we've been using them interchangeably. So let's look here, according to the Harvard Business Review, at a difference in definition between leader and manager. And for the early parts of this course, we are, we are using them a bit interchangeably. But to be technical, a leader is one who's producing and responding to change by seeing opportunities in the instability. So the leader is taking advantage of the instability by finding innovation, new ideas. A manager, in comparison, they're responding to that instability by trying to find ways to reduce it, focusing on control, on predictability on reducing that instability. So it's quite possible in a role that you will have, you will both be the leader and the manager. Create more certainty, predictability, stability for your workers, for your company. But at the same time, you wanna take advantage of the instability and the opportunities it provides uh, to create uh, new ideas, new innovations for your organization. All right, so whether you're a leader, or whether you're a manager, uh, we've been looking at those quality, those skills of the effect of an effective individual in that position. So if you're working along with us, 
uh, with the, I lost the book here. All right. <laughs> All right, if you're working along with us in uh, the Revel version of the Pearson Fundamentals of Management with Robbins, we are doing those personal assessments to look at our strengths, our weaknesses as managers. And so related to that list that we just looked at in terms of the qualities of a manager, uh, Pearson Revel has this assessment where you can look at 84 questions to look at what are your strengths in terms of that list of management skills. And in fact, uh, what you find when you do that personal assessment is that first it looks at how you're doing in terms of your management skills. So maybe you scored high and you have the above average uh, management skills. It also takes that list of those qualities of an effective manager and groups them together into a number of categories. Uh, so I'm actually gonna pull up a little bit bigger here, this bigger picture maybe. So what it does is it takes those skills and it groups them together into those that are related to self-awareness, managing stress, being creative. Are you communicating supportively? Are you gaining power and influence? Are you motivating others? Are you managing conflict, empowering and engaging? Are you building effective teams and leading positive change? So as we reflect on ourselves as managers, these are all the skills that we strive to have as an effective manager. So if you are taking the course and using uh, the Pearson Revel material with us, uh, take that quiz and see how you're doing. What is your strength as a manager? So here, this is me, so don't judge, uh, solving problems creatively and building effective teams and teamwork were my strengths as a manager. My lowest one is managing stress. I am very much a ducks in a row kind of person. I need to have a plan, a backup plan. Um, life is a game of chess, and so I like to think of uh, options. So I don't do well uh, <laughs> in terms of, uh, of dealing with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so you see the managing stress one is, is lower for me. So what are your strengths? and uh, where might you want to focus your efforts as you are improving uh, yourself as a manager. So check that out, see how you're doing. Uh, if you're working along with us uh, in this course, then for your participation marks, uh, take that screen capture of your uh, management skills and upload that to our Learning Management System Blackboard what dimension is your strongest? What dimension might you need to work on? So uh, screen capture that, that information about yourself and tell us which one is your strength. So we talked about how one of those, just come back to our skills here, you can see gaining power and influence. So let's talk a little bit more about how we influence others. So when we talk about influence, we're talking about the ability to persuade others. How do you get people to do what you want them to do? Well, when it comes to influence, you can get people to do what you want them to do if you have positional power. That is, people listen to you because of the role that you are in. Which ties back to a discussion we had previously. When we were talking about Bernard, he was talking about authority. It's the same kind of thing in terms of influence, the ability to persuade. Um, authority is a bit more structured. Um, but even if you don't have an official position, uh, you can have influence and persuade people. How you influence people, though, you can influence them because of your positional power. So what type of authority would that have been under Bernard's discussion? What were the two types of authority that led to that zone of indifference? We had 
authority of position and authority of leadership. So when we talk about influence in terms of positional power, getting people to listen to you because of the role you're in, that would be the authority of position that Bernard was talking about. You can also influence and persuade people based on your personal power. You get people to listen to you because you have social capital. They respect you. So what authority is that according to Bernard? That's the authority of leadership. Right? So how do you increase that social capital? How do you get people to listen to you? And how do you get people to do what you want, even if you don't have that management or leadership title, that authority of position or positional power? Well, if you are seen as a problem solver, a team player, if you speak up at meetings, and when you speak up, it doesn't waste everyone else's time because you have informed opinions, questions. If you're seen as someone who goes out of their way to help others, lighten the load of your team members, if you're respectful, and if you demonstrate integrity. So going back to that idea of moral leadership, uh, moral leadership gives you that social capital, that personal power, that authority of leadership, that ability to influence others. So if we don't have the authority of position, that positional power, so we're trying to work within our own personal power or authority of leadership, how would you convince your boss to give you the day off? So we call this managing up. How do you convince people to do what you want if they are in authority above you? Okay, well, let's suppose you're trying to get the day off on Friday. What could you do? You could offer to work a different shift. You could offer to come in when they're having trouble finding other people. You could appeal to their emotions, right, and tell them that, you know, I really need the day off because my child has a special event at school. Um, we're so proud of, of our kid and uh, their ability to perform in front of the group. And I really, really want to be there. So when you are managing up, we're looking at how do we persuade people? How do we win their hearts and win their minds? So you can win people's hearts by making it personal, right? Talking about that personal story of um, our child uh, performing at school. We speak to emotion by talking about how proud we are of our kid and how important it is. Maybe it was a struggle for our child um, to be able to have the courage to perform. We tell a story. We can use analogies. We're trying to get uh, those uh, we're trying to persuade to empathize with us and to have that same feeling that we have. We're trying to win their hearts. We can also try to win minds. We're trying to create change within the organization. We could provide data evidence. If we do this, if we make this change to our process, uh, then we will be able to produce more. Customer satisfaction will go up. Provide data. Okay? Appeal to the rational side of people. Weighing the costs and benefits. Show that the benefits outweigh the costs of implementing this change. Asking questions. Getting people to think critically. That guides them in that direction uh, in terms of trying to convince them what you're after by pointing out the benefits of that perspective. Uh, pointing out some of the flaws of, of other approaches by asking questions. So, so when do you focus on the heart? When do you focus on the mind? Well, often our approach uh, in general is a combination of the two, right? So we talked about getting that day off. You told the story about why you need it. That's you're trying to win the hearts. You've also offered uh, to fill other shifts providing evidence that it's not such a hardship to give you what you want, um, that's winning minds. So it's often a combination of the two. When should you emphasize one more of the other? Well, it comes down to the person who you are trying to influence. Is the decision that they're making, the thing you're trying to persuade them, is it more of an emotional decision, a gut decision? Is it more of a decision that should 
not include an emotional component. It needs to be more of a um, more clinical fact-based uh, decision. So think about them and their authority in terms of making the decision. What do they have the ability to make the decisions based on to help gear your you to that? What you see here on the right uh, in terms of this little clip, this comes from the Harvard Business Review, looking at you can win hearts when you're introducing new ideas, right? So we're coming up with new innovations. You're presenting something that's disruptive to the listener's sense of self. So it can be emotional experience for them. So you're trying to win them over by helping them deal with that change that they will experience, that emotion they will experience. You're leading a team through conflict. So again, you're helping them deal with that emotional aspect by appealing to the emotional aspect. Um, if you're trying to gain support for decisions that have already been made, so they've already done that evidence-based process, the mind-based process, um, and you're trying to get it reconsidered then, um, or to champion decisions that have already been made, then you're focusing more on the heart. It's more of the mind when you're trying to change direction, when you want to help people who are overwhelmed, um, they're overanalyzing it, you're simplifying it in terms of pros and cons, or if it's very complex, then trying to simplify it through um, that evidence that can be more effective. So if you're doing the Pearson Revel assessments with us, uh, take the test about using influence strategies. How, are, how do you influence people? And when you do that assessment, what we'll find is that it classifies you into one of three strategies, retribution, reciprocity, or reason. That is, do you influence people uh, through coercion, through force? So with the retribution strategy, essentially, if you don't do what I say, there will be repercussions, right? There's going to be consequences. In reciprocity, you do what I'm asking, I'll do something else for you. In the reason strategy, we're trying to appeal to that cost-benefit analysis in terms of the, the gains for you are better than uh, the, the downsides. So when we were looking before at winning hearts and minds, that reason strategy, right, that's the minds, we talked about we're trying to convince our boss to give us the day off, right? We uh, might say, well, I'll work the next day instead. So that trade off, that's reciprocity. So the question is, is there ever a role where the retribution strategy might be the preferred strategy? Well, what if you're trying to convince your kids to eat dinner, right? You could reason with that. Here are the benefits of eating dinner. You're no longer hungry. It's healthy for you. You could do reciprocity, eat your dinner, and you get dessert. But maybe that's not effective, or maybe you don't want to give them dessert. Uh, then there is that retribution strategy. So if you think about the kid refusing to eat dinner, it's eat your meal, or you don't get to leave the table, right? So there are consequences for your actions. When in business, might you use the retribution strategy? Well, if it's a high risk job, then there may not be the time when you make decisions to reason it out. There may not be the authority to provide things in exchange. Because of the risk of the job, it may be that you need to follow command or else people get hurt. And so if we think about, for example, the military, right? You do what's told or you get uh, discharged, uh, there are repercussions. So it's more of a retribution strategy. We also see this in management of sports, right? So if you've ever been on a team and uh, the team isn't performing well, isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, is goofing off, then you run laps. Uh, so that's a retribution strategy. If you don't do what I'm telling you to do, there is a punishment or penalty. So what kind of influence do you use? So we'll just go here. I'll just go back to a bigger picture here. All right. So we can see here for me, 
Um, I use more of a reason influence. I think I said earlier, I am a ducks in a row kind of person, uh, an economist uh, by trade, a statistician by trade. And so for me, it's very much the pros and cons and weighing those costs and benefits. Uh, when I try to persuade others, it's the facts, it's the data um, to try to uh, to get them to to go with whatever uh, I'm pushing as, as my strategy or agenda. All right, so let's just talk about one last topic here. And that is how should we assess the performance of managers? So we'll look at this one last topic here from Minsberg. And as we look at how do we do performance evaluations? How do we know if the manager is doing their job, especially if uh, their job is very open ended? Right. We talked about that previously. So how do you assess managers? Well, according to Minsberg, there are a number of threads that you use to assess managers. Are they energetic? And so we want leaders who are passionate, who are go-getters. So we look at that energy. Are they reflective? So they're able to look at decisions that have been made. What was good? What was bad? What should we do differently? Are they analytical? That is, they are able to observe, collect data, come up with recommendations from that. There are some other ones here as well that Minsberg has. The next one is worldly. And so the point here is to respect one's own practical experiences, to identify that you have, in a, that the individual as a manager has lived experiences and recognizes those lived experiences and ties them to the work. And they also can recognize that other people have lived experiences and they respect and take those into consideration as well. So you're not, when someone makes comments, makes recommendations, says here's how we could do something differently, you're not just immediately shutting them down, you're recognizing that they have that authority uh, that social capital, right, in terms of the authority of leadership, that people respect them based on the fact that they have that lived experience. They know and they've done things that inform those recommendations. You are collaborative. You're helping people work together. So not just empowerment or collaboration. So <laughs> don't define words with the same word. So what do we mean by all this? So Empowerment collaboration can become buzzwords uh, within a business. And what Minsberg is talking about here is a deeper level of helping people work together. So it's not just building teams, assigning you to a group. It's not just putting you in a room and saying you come up with some recommendations, which ultimately we'll ignore. It's not about delegating so that other people do it, but it's about providing the resources that people need so that they can actually make informed recommendations so that you can use what they've come up with so that you don't have to do it all yourself so that the team can come up with it. So it's about providing the support system so that the, those who are collaborating, working can actually um, make an impact. As a manager, you need to be proactive. So are you an agent of change? So are you helping the organization? We talk about change management in terms of um, we might change the way we do things. Our organizational structure might change. How do we help people through those transitions? Dropping off, stopping some product lines, creating new ones. How do we help make that transition? And the last thread from Minsberg is that the manager needs to be integrative. The manager does synthesis on the run. So we've talked before about how managers have to make quick decisions. They have to divide the work into chunks. And then at the end, pull it back together and look at the big picture. So they need to be able to pull all those pieces together to see the details 
and the big picture simultaneously in order to make quick decisions. So can your manager synthesize on the run?